I'm here with my great friend Ken Knowlton. We've been friends for 50 years. Ken is a distinguished computer scientist and artist, and I thought it would be great to get a few things on, on uh, video about his life and work. So, Ken, you started as a boy on a farm here. That's right, yeah. And in a one-room schoolhouse? One-room schoolhouse, yes, indeed. And how did that get you, get you to Cornell? Well, the one-room schoolhouse uh, led to a large uh, school down, normal kind of school downtown where I graduated and uh, in decent class standing and uh, applied to Cornell. That's where my, my folks went. But but you were in a very unusual course that took a, took a five years for, for, for a bachelor's degree. Yeah. That's right, engineering physics. Five wow. years. Five years. Ouch. Yeah. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> and engineer five times. <laughs> and engineering physics is different from engineering how? It dealt with the principles, the basic physical principles of materials, not not how you do something, but why it works. Hmm. So essentially why you do whatever you do with milling machines and so forth. Yes, the the, the, the theory. Theory of, of all of that stuff. Wow! Yeah. Did you work with milling machines or just uh, equations? Oh yes, oh yes. We we did a lot of courses, regular courses in electron, elect, uh, electrical engineering and uh, machine work. Yes, we we had our hands on. Oh yeah. Wow! Yeah. And so that led to your next degree, which was still at Cornell. That's right, my master's degree. Yeah. And that and and there you did something really amazing. Well. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, I did something that was kind of hard. Yes, I don't know whether you call it amazing. It was I, I developed uh, I modified an electron microscope. I used an electron microscope or uh, parts of it to uh, make an X-ray shadow projection microscope, which which means a, a small point of making a small point of X-rays, like a point source of X-rays, putting a target between that and a far away. A photographic plate, and uh, reversibly, so that I could take myself out and, and end up with the original electron microscope in functioning order. Wow, that's like borrowing the family car and 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 uh, and hot riding it overnight and putting it back in the original condition. Uh, yeah, that's a good that's a good metaphor. Yeah, yeah. So, what were you able to photograph with that? I photographed uh, my my great. Project was to, I guess I photographed a bed bug or, or something, I think, some, some <laughs> kind of insect, and, and made a big X-ray image of it. Wow! Yeah. Wow. And and you and so so that's your master's thesis. That was my master's thesis. Wow. Yes. yes. And then from that, <clears throat> what what happened then before you went to MIT? I went uh, with my wife to a. Uh, uh, work camp in Mexico, Friend Service Committee work camp, uh, first in El Salvador, then Mexico. Oh, and there I, there I got polio. And that's why you and walked with a cane now. That, that, and that's why, I, yes, I do. Yes, that's why I walked with a cane ever since, essentially. Um, came back to, after, after recovering from the acute stage, I came back to... Uh, Cornell for a year, actually, as di directing, taking care of the electron microscope laboratory. But in the process, I, I was tripped up by an idea of mine. I thought uh, computers were coming on scene, and I might... Wouldn't it be interesting if computers could be used to translate languages, I thought. Hey! Yeah, how about that? And, so, and when I was working up that idea, I opened up Scientific American, and there... <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't the first person to think of it. This guy at uh, MIT had written a, an article about the translation of languages, human languages by computer. That was Ingvi, right? Ingvi, yes, yes. And, and I, I, I got in touch with him, uh, went to see him. Uh, it was seemed exciting. I applied to MIT and it was accepted and I worked in his laboratory with his, in his group. Uh, working on that project, that very idea, machine translation. Yes. And your thesis was about that? It was, a, yes, indeed. And it was written in the... It, written in a language that they were developing there, called Comet. I, I don't remember I don't remember what C-O-M-I-T stands for, but, but anyway, it was, a, it was a language in, for... especially for treating letters and words and sentence structures and stuff like that. 
Yeah, and I worked on the development of a computer language in, in that lab. And you in said that basically you would you would feed it a sentence and then uh, reward or punish it if it got the tra if it got the parsing right. Oh, that that was my thesis work. Yeah, my my thesis work was in that done in that place. Uh, not, not only did I have a research assistantship, but I, but my thesis work was exactly that. I, I'd give it a sentence, uh, ask it to parse uh, with no rules, and it would, of course produce gibberish. And then I kind of slapped it by saying no. Here, here's the real structure of that, that sentence. Then I'd give it another sentence and ask it and, and say no, and, but, but here's the way it should have been done. And, and I kept doing that, feeding a sentence, and it would uh, mess it up. And, and But I kept feeding another. I, I would always give it then the answer and feed it another sentence and another one and the answer and another one and then the it would, we would keep trying and trying, but it got better. That's got, the important thing. Yeah, that's, that's... it got better after I fed it the right, my correct answer for the structure, you know, long noun phrase, verb phrase, all that stuff. I, yes, it got better, and it, it got good enough that uh, they said, yes, that's a thesis. And so that got you the PhD. That got me. Yes. And you had the most amazing PhD committee. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it was Ingvi and? Ingvi and uh, Noam Chomsky and uh, Marvin Minsky. Yeah, <laughs> how about that? Bingo. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> and I've kept in touch with all of them a little bit uh, as the years went by. I've met a couple of them here and there. Yeah. Now tell your, tell your Norbert Wiener elevator story. Uh, I would say yes. Uh, everybody, you know, everybody has a Norbert Wiener story. Here's mine. <clears throat> we're, walking and we're walking down the hallway, and, and I ask him a question, and he starts answering, and he talks and talks and talks, and, and we walk, and we happen to be going up the same elevator, and, and he's, he's, he's answering my question. I forget what we were talking about, but the funny thing was we didn't have, he didn't have enough time to answer the question. He pushed the stop button on the elevator. He stopped us between floors, and he kept talking for about two minutes until <laughs> we came to the end of his, his explanation of, of whatever it was I wish I knew. I wish I could remember. And then he pulled the stop button, and, and, and on we went in our different ways, yes. Well, that, that sounds That's like Wiener. I have my own. Lots of, lots of other people have their own Norbert Wiener stories. He was, <laughs> he was a funny and a weird guy. Yeah. So how did you get to Bell Laboratories? I interviewed th th with three places, RCA, um, um, uh, I, I forget all of Well, anyway, Bell Labs was the was the, the, the favorite, and, and they invited me down once, and, and somehow nothing clicked, but I said, isn't there some other way? And they, I kind of kind of twisted their arm as, as best I could, or, or appealed more, and they invited me down again, and, and they found a notch uh, notch for me, a place for me. But you said and, that they, they, they required a loyalty oath first. Yes, they, they wanted the, the loyalty oath. They, they, I was supposed to sign something that, that said... Um, I was not a member, never have been a member of this and that, all that communist stuff. And I, I objected because, you know, somebody who was a communist was obviously sign it. I mean, somebody who was up to no good would sign this, right? Right. I wrote a letter saying, this is stupid, this is, this is a political thing on your part. And, and I, I, I don't really don't want to sign this. I, I, as a matter of fact, I have not been a member of these things, but, but this is, I object to this policy. Uh, and I don't see any usefulness for it. It's part of the hysteria about these things. Anyway, um, the PR, the, the vice president of research, waived my signing it. Maybe he took my statement as, as the, 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 the affirmation that he presumably needed, but I thought it was crazy, the whole thing. But he, he waived the thing for me. I, by his good graces, I, I became a member of the... Uh, computer Techniques Research Department, yeah. Well, Bill, Bill always had an enlightened policy. Now, what was it, what, what was the mandate of the Computer Techniques Research Department? We were to do research. We weren't developing product for sale. We were doing research, uh, developing ways of doing things. And, f and for me, that very soon became computer graphics because there was a new machine there that could make pictures, just about any picture you could define by letters on screen or spots on the screen or, or lines on the screen and with a photographic camera looking at it and a, and a command, you only had to do is write a program that made a tape with all these instructions. The tape would be carried to this uh, machine, the Stromberg Graphics Microfilm Printer, and it would draw the spots with the camera looking at the screen, 
and if a machine said next frame, the camera would click to the next frame, and you draw the have the program make the instructions to draw the spots. You could make movies. You could make still pictures or movies by computer, and why not? Uh, why not a certain kind of movie? And you proposed to your boss. I proposed to my boss. I said, "Hey, um, how about a, a movie uh, where every frame consists of lots of different brightnesses across the line, you know, line after line, uh, every spot, different brightnesses to make overall picture that you, you know, of big, of big words and so forth, and these could be made of little letters or different sizes of spot or something like that, and it's the kind of picture that these days you would call a raster scan picture or a bitmap picture. It consists of, well, many, many more dots than I use. I use something like 200 across by 150 high, approximately, you know. These days, it's, it's, it's 2,000 across by, uh, by 1,000 and some high. And these days, it's much finer, many, many more. So know, we don't know times. if you made the first rasterized movie or not. I may have been the first person that made a rest. I, I think I was the first person who made a rasterized movie, and, and almost definitely the first person who made a language for making that kind of movie. Yeah, right. That's, that's what I think. Uh, now you got to movie. you got to BTL at, in at 1960, 1962. 1962. 1962. And your 1962. language, B you 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 were actually writing about it the next year, right? I developed it during 1963. Yeah. Yeah. And and that was and, published in 63 or 64. In uh, 64, I think. In, yep. By 64, I had, in the early 64, I had made a movie using it, describing the way that it was made. I exactly. was describing the, the B-Flix language by a movie that was made in B-Flix. It was a, no, no, no sound. It was all letters on the screen. And it was a, you know, kind of dreary in that sense, but, but it was made entirely by the method that it was describing. So, and that was presented at the Spring Joint Computer Conference in the, of uh, 1964. Yeah, right. yeah. So, did many people use Vflex besides yourself? Mm, not directly. Uh, I worked with people yes. uh, who, and, and there were several collaborations that I had with uh, medical people or, or. Teachers of uh, of uh, electronics or electrical engineering or displaying of data for a great number of purposes. Uh, when you when you see things, you understand it much better than when you're looking at numbers. Uh, collaborations with people outside. A professor from uh, George Washington University. Um, on uh, radiation patterns, you know, uh, cross-section of the body is re radiated for a tumor or something. Or, or another pro project we had was a very early simulation of what it might look like if you had electrodes in the, uh, for a blind person, electrodes in the visual cortex. And B-Flex simulate, use, use to simulate that. And, uh, well, there, there had been work done by a, somebody in England a Brindley in England who had stuck, I think, maybe a dozen electrodes in the head of a volunteer blind nurse and, and demonstrated that she could see, um, uh, subjectively see, so to speak, spots of light. And our wow. question was, what if, what if you had maybe a 10 by 10 array of them, you know, 100 of them, pushed into, into the visual cortex. Could, could you present letters or something like that? So we, we made movies showing what, the, what that might look like what, 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 at, at this, you know. And, and, and at this conference, there was a conference in, I think it was 73, about, uh, you know, exactly this thing that is now being developed, actually, uh, a visual prosthesis. Now, you said that you were also involved in a, in, a, in an attempt to project the future with a group of other people. You were looking ahead, was it 10 years? Oh, yes, from about 66 to 76. Um, so in 66, you were asked to look at 1976. Yes, well, what would be the speed, the capacities, of, and all that sort of thing? What would the state of... And we, we studied that, the, about, about six of us from very different parts of Bell Labs, and and uh, came up with uh, 
an, an estimate of uh, how small or how big your memories would be. I mean, that's, that, that's, things looking back from now were terribly crude oh, these yeah. days. I had something very heavy that had my own data on it. Uh, ten platters that I would take in and put on the disk drive and rev it up. And, and that heavy thing that was my own memory of uh, my own stuff on the, was, would you believe how small? It was two megabytes. Wow, and that was a lot <laughs> back then. How big was, how big was the computer? My was, own personal two megabytes, yes. How big was the computer's main memory at that time? Well, that that that's memory. I don't I don't know how much that memory was. I mean, it, it was a, it was a, it was not the main computer. It was a small a small special. Well, it, it's a small special computer that occupied only a small room. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, when you when you made your raster movie, did you have any sense of what it might become in terms of the entertainment systems we have today that are rasterized? No, movies? no, I had no. I, I in fact I. I there was a conference where where four of us stood up on our hind feet and <laughs> and uh, and showed you know, Frank Linden showed his uh, his uh, force mass and motion uh, how planets move under various laws laws of gravity. It was Frank Linden, yes. Uh, Frank Linden, yeah. Ed Zajac showed a satellite going about the Earth, oriented Earth, pointing Earth uh, by certain rules and functions. Uh, Mike Knoll had uh, other things that he showed about the uh, for the uh, proposal of showing dance patterns of a group of dancers as, as they might move on on the stage. Dance patterns, wow! Uh, I, I showed my Beeflix stuff. Afterwards, somebody said to me, "Someday we will we will um, simulate. We will recreate Doris Day posthumously. Doris <laughs> Day and Rock Hudson in a movie." And I said, nothing like that will ever be done. Because think of the human effort in defining all of the joints of the skeleton and the muscle on the bones and the skin on the muscle and the hair sprouting from the skin, blowing in the, being, blown, being blown by the wind. Uh, nobody, that would take far too much effort Nothing, nothing like that ever will be done. <laughs> and tell me, and, and but as you know, it has in <laughs> spades. I mean, and so, for the camera, Ken, what was your reaction to Avatar? I remember it being very funny. Oh, oh, I. You hated it, right? Well, I, th I thought I, I, I didn't hate it. I was, I was kind of stunned by it because what I saw in that was it was just lifetimes of work defining exactly what I said, but people had done it, had in fact devoted that energy to defining all, you know, to, to specifying all of that uh, from the bones and, and everything up and to the, to the wind and the effects. So that's, that's one thing. One, the one of my responses to that was, was, wow, that everybody worked so hard for that thing. My other, my other response simultaneously was, why? Uh, it was, what was the point? Were they telling a story, or was it, was it just a, a mishmash of, of all of those different effects competing with each other for your attention? You know, uh, the, 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 I, I think that the result of that was people like me saying, how did they do that? How did they do that? How did they do that? And rather than following the storyline. <laughs> It was it was not helpful for telling a story, but I, as I recall, you seem to be indignant about that use of cycles for entertainment. Oh well, yes, but uh, I guess I was. Yes, I was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So now looking ahead to the, to, let's talk about some of the other things you did at Bell. For example, the most wonderful interface I've ever seen was your merit was your mm -hmm. magical keyboard where one's own fingers become transparent. You want to talk about that? I like I, I agree with you. I think that's that may be the, the, the cutest thing I, I worked on. I, I, I like that myself. I guess you yes. showed, to that, showed that to me about 1976, right? Yes, I think so. I think that I, I believe that's I, I believe that's right. Yeah. So just to, just to describe it for the camera, the idea is you look <coughs> down, here is your, you see your fingers typing through a keyboard uh, on a keyboard, but your fingers are transparent, as the keys underneath change their labels. 
the, 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 here, here's the picture. The, the, yes, you're looking through a semi-transparent mirror. So you're seeing your fingers on the keys down here. You're seeing the, through the, you're seeing the fingers on the keys. The, key, the keys are actually black. There, there's nothing on the keys, no labels. But because it's a mirror halfway, it's, you're also seeing what's on a, a cathode ray too, a, a television tube essentially. Or it could here. be LCDs now, yeah. Yes, but, but it, was a, it was a bulging space. <laughs> and, and so the image of that is on the bulging set of keys. The, the, the set of keys had to, to, to make them in three dimensions uh, visually seem to be on the, the labels. In other words, the labels are on the television set, but they look seem to be on the keys, and since you're seeing both images together, it looks like your hand is transparent. It's wonderful. In, in three dimensions. In other words, you can look at this from any point, and you see the labels on the keys under your fingers. Yes. And, and for that matter, the, uh, some of the labels disappear, which means that that key is not operable. There's no point of poking it in the black space. You only poke at the keys that are, that are shown at the moment. Like, like for example, a telephone operator's console. If, if the, the point at this, if this point in the call, that the thing that needs to be put in is a telephone number, only the telephone number, uh, the, the number keypad appears, and those those things are lit, and you can type in the telephone number. And they're under. They're, you it, see them through your fingers. Through your fingers, you, you see, and you, you 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 see through the finger, through your fingers, because the numbers are under your fingers. If you're left-handed, uh, of course, you, you've set the thing up so that the keyboard appears over here on the other side, sure. and you do with your left hand, you, you type in the number there. Well, <clears throat> to me, that was I like that better than anything else you've done, but, the, but you've done so many great things. Now, you worked with artists on B-Flix, you worked with Stan Vanderbeek, for example. Yes, right, right. And did you make movies with him? Made, we made movies, yes. Yes, and yes. with other artists we won't name right now. And uh, and uh, that's a very distinguished record of, of your Beeflix films. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. Now talk about talk about your art with um, uh, the, the the mosaic art that resulted in a way from the Beeflix approach. Mm. That you were in Beeflix, you were using pixels of various levels of darkness, and you converted that into actual pictures, like the picture of Jacques Cousteau at the Exploratorium. Yes. In a sense, very crude pictures. Because seashells were the pixels of of the, of the resulting uh, image, the one of Cousteau, uh, the one of Cousteau, and that might have been a total of uh, about um, a thousand seashells uh, for the whole for the whole thing, which means maybe um, a hundred eighty across by a hundred and ten high or thereabouts, uh, just on, on in squares. I, I, what, I, what I did was to to computerize, you know, a method of deciding how bright each of those square areas was in the an original photo, and then replace that in, in, effectively by a seashell that reflects that amount of light for each. But because all of these seashells, of course, had to be sorted in advance for for about maybe 15 to 20 um, shades of gray, so to speak, degrees of reflecting light. And, uh, you were talking about showing this to your wife walking down the hall. She didn't believe it would look like John Cousteau. <laughs> she, I was putting it out on a table like this, and she thought I was kind of odd and crazy. What was the heck? What the heck I was doing? Because these these images you have to look at from far away to see the overall picture. When you're up up close, you you, you don't see anything. And you, you see seashells. So so what? And she thought uh, she looked at it and she thought I was I was nuts and I, I took it out and put it at the on the floor because they were all loose. I had to carry, carry them carefully out and put it, put the whole set on the floor, put a mirror at a forty five degree angle so we could look at it from the other end of the hallway. And and we walked down the hall and uh, I'm sure she was getting ready to say I love you anyway. Uh, <laughs> that's not what she said. I said, okay, now at the other end of the hall, about 60 feet away, turn around and look, look at the picture. And she turned around and she said, oh my God. <laughs> it, was, it was a photograph, essentially, of Jacques Cousteau in Seychelles. Right. That and you've gone on doing that with, with other artworks and, oh, and, yes. and, 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 and uh, yes. seashells and other objects. Oh, and Colored and, dice. Yes. yes. And dominoes. Yes. I did trick some... 
uh, particular two problems with dominoes. They come two two cells by two, and so you have to chop the picture into those rectangular. Areas. Oy, oy, oy. And the other thing is, you want to do it in a. You don't want to just use uh, extra sets of dominoes because the picture calls for this combination, these combinations, and and nowhere does it want a blank next to a nine, you know, bright <laughs> next to next to black, next to white. The pictures don't just come that way. The, 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 usually, the next door area is very close to the one you're looking at, and. And so, but but my to, to make it a tough problem, but more interesting, I used like for example, exactly all of the dominoes of six sets. Oh man! <clears throat> well, how do, how do you do that? I mean, that's, that's uh, and then this Japanese know, but, company created this Jigazo <coughs> thing, right? Oh yes, right. <laughs> well, we we you know, I <clears throat> I started that, and my friend uh, Mark. Uh, Help productize it essentially, and uh, this Tenyo company sort of producing it. Yes, that's marvelous for Japan and China. So your glory days at Bell Labs were about twenty years until gradually twenty years. Yeah. Bell Labs went downhill, and the chance to innovate without restriction went away. Yes, it, it um, things were being reorganized. Uh, work had to be more. Devoted to product ultimate for sale, something saleable or useful, you know. Or so they hoped. Uh, uh, pardon? Or so they hoped. Yeah, so they hoped. Yeah, it had to be, you know, aiming at that, uh, and uh, and it couldn't be just free uh, play, I guess you might say. But you know, serious development. I mean, I was working on imagery, uh, images, how how to record them in, into digital form, store them, retrieve them, compress them for transmission, because transmission of pictures was expensive, you know, sort of narrow bandwidth, um, re receive them at the other end, uh, preferably coarse image information first, as you st still, still sometimes see, <clears throat> and and then the refinement of the of this piece the, the small parts uh, progressively I, I got a couple of patents on on these these processes um, but uh, but this is general I mean this isn't for a specific purpose it's it's generally useful techniques yeah. for, is what the whole department is working on pro pro programming languages and and routines and ideas you know it's having to do with with any kind of data, well, what kinds of data, you know, this kind or that kind, and, and so forth. You know. And so they were able to encourage you to work with artists because that well, was that's part one kind of imagery. Yeah, part of learning what computers could do. That's right. They they produce. There may be different kinds of uh, images, and and indeed, indeed there are different different kinds of images uh, and requirements and uh, and uh, different criteria for whether you're doing well and reproducing the picture well. Are you, are you, first of all, capturing it well? Are you reproducing it well? Are you presenting it uh, well when you reproduce it or send it away and get it, you know, receive it there? So it was actually a rationale for working with artists. Oh, yeah. It's great it, for it's the artists and great it's, for you. It's a, it presents somewhat different problems and different criteria for success, yes. 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 That, so, that, and that's ultimately a use, yeah. conceivably, of, of for whatever. Well, it's very unfortunate that, that so much effort is made into immediate oh. profit these days, and and, oh. uh, and places like Bell Labs in its glory days just don't exist it anymore. It was a wonderful place. I mean, a lot of stuff that was ultimately useful for for products, for for not only Bell System, but for other places, and and, uh, and a lot has been learned, yeah. I mean, but they couldn't know at the time. That was the thing. Right. Right, right. Why don't we close with that wonderful quote when you when you suggested to your boss about uh, using the move about making movies on the machine? Oh, when I first suggested that, yeah, <laughs> that was that was that was very that was just a, just a couple of weeks, three weeks maybe after I landed there. I, I was I was playing around with the initial problem that I kind of solved, and it was a two dimensional stuff and. And I thought, well, aren't all pictures, can't you use that for lots of different kinds of pictures? I thought, how about a, a language, computer language, for making pictures out of, out of 
these rest of skin, you know, what we now call bitmap pictures. And I, I, I spelled it out in about three pages. And, um, and he said... What was his name? That was, uh, that, that was Tom Crowley. Tom Crowley. My, my department head. And uh, I, I wrote this three-page memo saying, uh, couldn't there be a language for, for making movies like this, we, which became, you know, paper? He, he, he said, he said the two, two things in, 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 in this order, two, two crucial sentences of my career. He said, it looks terribly ambitious, but why don't you see what you can do? So <laughs> <laughs> I was off and running. I... <laughs> And we can all see what you can do because because uh, those movies are are on the net now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Ken, thank you so much. I hated to run through your life like that, but we wanted to keep it short for the video. Well, thanks for inviting me. Thank you.